Welcome to the third video in the uh, video series, Control Design for this Rotary Pendulum. And right now it's not the pendulum, it's actually just an inertia disk. And that's because we will estimate a friction model today. And uh, we will go straight into VS Code. Uh, I have a little script that will help us to collect the data and estimate the model. Uh, but first we're going to talk a bit about friction models. So here I've written uh, force is uh, mass times acceleration. Uh, and that's uh, true if there is no friction. Uh, but uh, if there is some friction also, that typically depends on the velocity. So there is some additional term that depends on velocity. And now this is a rotational system. Uh, so if we, instead of talking about acceleration, masses and forces, we talk about torques, uh, rotational inertias, uh, rotational accelerations, and force is now a function of the angular velocity. So so if we have an angle phi and we differentiate that, we get the, the angular velocity omega. And if we differentiate that, we get the angular acceleration, we call it alpha here. So if we would like to estimate this function f here, uh, how could we do that? So torque is the, the, what we apply to the, to the system. That's the control input. Uh, but if we are interested in, in the parameters of this function f, then we are slightly bothered by, by this term because uh, we need to know also this parameter here to be able to estimate the friction model. But a common trick in this kind of friction estimation is that you, you run a velocity controller on the device so that the velocity is constant. And if velocity is constant, acceleration is zero. So then this term will be zero and we will uh, essentially record tau is equal to just the friction. And if we look a bit deeper into the friction model, a very common uh, model of friction for a system like this is that we have some term uh, that depend on the sign of the velocity. So it doesn't matter how quick you move, uh, as long as you move in the same direction, you have the same contribution of this uh, term. It's often called Coulomb friction and sometimes in some uh, contexts it's called dry friction. And then we have some term that is proportional to the velocity. So if we double the velocity, we, uh, we double the friction force. And that's, I call the parameter here Kv, V for viscous friction. So that's perhaps things like um, the grease in the bearings and, and stuff like that. So typically the friction is made up out of these two terms. So friction can be much more complicated than this. Uh, we can have a higher order polynomial here. We can have things like uh, uh, stiction and uh, the Strybeck effect, uh, which we are not going to, to bother with modeling uh, here today. So we're gonna estimate this simple model, perhaps with a quadratic term here or something like that. All right, um, the next step is to have a look at a little function I've written to collect some uh, experimental data on this device. Uh, so we start by loading up the Quanser interface that we talked about in the first video. Uh, we also load a package for uh, PID controllers. Then I have this function here, velocity control. So it takes the a duration, a final time, reference function and the parameters for the PI controller. Uh, I start by initializing the device so that more or less turn it on by software. Uh, I compute how many steps I'm going to run my loop, uh, how much data I need to store. I initialize a, a vector here to store the data. Uh, I then uh, instantiate my PID controller with the parameters I passed in here. And I s initialize some state here for the old measurement and filtered uh, velocity. All right, uh, then I, uh, within a try catch, uh, block, I turn off the garbage collector in Julia because if the garbage collector decides it needs to collect garbage, uh, that can take a while and that might mess with our timing in the control loop. Uh, and the reason I have try catch here is that if uh, something in here fails or I terminate it, I always want to be guaranteed that I enable the garbage collector again. And what can happen otherwise is that Julia will consume more and more memory and, and eventually run out of memory. Uh, so if I allocate some memory here while the garbage collector is uh, turned off, I will in fact uh, just accumulate that. Um, 
but that's not a problem because I don't allocate uh, too much memory here. And if I would be interested in allocating zero memory, uh, that wouldn't be too difficult either. Uh, but uh, for now, this is actually fine to turn off the, the garbage collector. Then I say uh, I iterate for the number of steps I computed above based on the final time. And then I have this macro periodically. Uh, this helps me to run this control loop with uh, interval TS sample time here. So this does the, it measures the execution time and, and makes sure to sleep the appropriate amount of time like we spoke about in the previous video. Then I uh, start the loop. I, I record some timing also for my own purposes here for the, for the data logging. Uh, I read a measurement from the device. Uh, since this is the DC servo, I only read a single measurement and I access the single measurement with this particular syntax. I could have written one here also, uh, but if I do like this, it will actually error on me if there is more than one measurement. Then I apply finite difference uh, approximation to the derivative. Uh, so y minus the current y minus the previous y divided by the sample time. That's an approximation to the derivative, so the velocity. And that will be a bit noisy, so I apply some exponential filtering here. So uh, ydf is now my filtered velocity. And then I pass uh, my reference and my filtered velocity into the PID controller and I get the control signal back and I pass that to the process. So P here is the, uh, my object that represents the physical process and I pass the control signal in there. Then I store some stuff in a log vector and I push that to my logging vector. And then I update my Y all so I can compute the, the velocity in the next uh, loop iteration. And if some error occurs within here, uh, maybe because I made a mistake or because I terminate uh, the loop prematurely, uh, then I catch that and I just say that uh, I'm terminating. And uh, finally, no matter what happens, error or not, I will always issue the control command zero in the end so that it stops and then I will turn on the garbage collector. Right, then I return the data. So I will run this and I will instantiate a cube servo object. So this uses now the C backend that I had uh, talked about before with a sample time of uh, 0 0.01 seconds. Then I have a reference function here and it looks a bit complicated, but it will start out at input uh, reference two. And then uh, with a certain interval, it will increase uh, the reference by two. And it will do that kind of in a square fashion. Uh, so I can uh, collect data from multiple different velocities here. And then I pass all of this in, into my function I created above. And when I do that, we see it starts running. And now the thing is moving. You can't see that, but let me tilt it. So perhaps you can see that it's moving. First, it's moving slowly. It's moving a bit quicker now, even quicker. You see the reference keeps updating here, 34. All right. I've said that I'm gonna run this for 25 seconds. So we'll see when 25 seconds have elapsed. All right, so it's done. And I got some data back. And then I have some code here to, to save the data to a CSV file if I want. And I can load that file up here. Uh, but for now, uh, let's plot the data we just collected. All right, we see that we have the reference here in orange and we have the recorded data in blue. And we see that we have a number of steps. The reference increases in uh, steps and it kind of increases more and more towards the end because I had this square in the reference function. And here in the bottom, we see the control signal. All right. Uh, now I said that um, to estimate this friction model and not bother with the inertial properties, we need to make sure that the acceleration is zero. So here I have some code to figure out when the acceleration is large. And if it is, I will filter that out. So I start by applying a central difference uh, to the uh, recorded velocity. And uh, that gives me an estimate of the acceleration. I filter that slightly because that's likely gonna be noisy. And then we can plot that. So here we see uh, the filtered, uh, 
acceleration in blue and the absolute value of that in orange. And the reason I take the absolute value is because I'm interested in filtering out places where the acceleration is large in magnitude. All right, so then I decide a certain threshold here. We see that every time I take a step, there is a large peak in acceleration and then there is a bit of an overshoot. Um, and then uh, we settle down to some just some background noise. So I set the threshold here somewhere so I get rid of the steps. All right, and I have a vector here that's a, it's called small acceleration that just filters out uh, whenever the acceleration is sufficiently small. All right, and now I collected data for rotation in one direction only. I would like to have data for uh, when it rotates in the other direction as well. So I have actually saved some data uh, for that. So we will just load that uh, and then we will proceed. Let's see here. Okay, I load that. All right. Now we have velocity zero here in the middle and we have velocity on the x-axis and we have the input. So the, the kind of the torque command here on the, the y-axis. We see we have some kind of slope. So these clusters of points, they correspond to the different velocities we ran with. And we filtered out all the data that was uh, during the steps. So we don't have any data between these clusters. All right, so that looks exactly the way we want. And then we see this slope doesn't intersect here at, intersect here at zero. It intersects at some positive value. And this is that Coulomb friction. So to start moving at all, even if it's very, very slow, we need a, a non-zero uh, force. And we can understand that if I point at this, if I push this uh, little uh, device here with a small force, uh, nothing happens at all. I need a certain uh, magnitude of the force before it starts moving at all. And that's kind of the stiction or the breakaway force. And we see that we have a value here, maybe 0 0.1, where that occurs. All right, so uh, to fit the friction model, uh, we will fit uh, this sine function and then we will have a, a low order polynomial. So here we have a linear term, a square term and a cubic term. Uh, term. And uh, since if we would have a square term here, uh, that would mess with us since we actually have an odd function here. So this is a square that keeps track of the sine. So for negative input values, it will be the negative square. All right, so otherwise it's just a cubic uh, polynomial. So these three terms would be a cubic polynomial and this would be the Coulomb friction here. And then I apply these uh, scaling factors for, for numerical performance. So we can run that. And the estimation in the least square sense is without any constraints, it's very simple. We just uh, take our regressor matrix here, A, um, Let's see here. It's four by the number of data points. And the first here is just the sign. So that corresponds to our Coulomb friction regressor. Then we have the velocity, the velocity square with the correct sign and the cubic term. And when we uh, compute the backslash here, that actually does a, a QR factorization of uh, A. But this, this is equivalent to solving the, the least squares problem. So W are now our coefficients. Then we apply the inverse numerical scaling I did here, and then we can plot. So now we have our data, uh, it's the blue points, and our model is the kind of the orange points here. Uh, we can look at the model coefficients, and we see here the, the first coefficient that corresponds to the Coulomb friction is 0 0.1. And that's exactly where this model kind of intersects the, uh, the y-axis here. And then we see we have a kind of a non-zero viscous term here as well. All right, so that was a fairly simple way of estimating a friction model for this device. And that can be useful uh, later when we're gonna uh, implement a controller for it. All right, thank you.